Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. So a while ago we did a really epic five part comparison of the militaries of the First Order, Galactic Empire, and Republic. After that video, a lot of you guys started suggesting that we do other comparisons and you guys had a lot of cool ideas, but there was one idea that kind of stuck out in my mind. I couldn't really stop thinking about it, and that was, what if the Galactic Empire invaded Earth? Now, I don't remember exactly who came out with this idea, but I do remember thinking at first, well, this is kind of silly, right? We're talking about reality versus a fictional franchise. How does that correlate? But then, the more I started thinking about it, the more interesting the scenario got, because actually, Earth is a lot more evenly matched with the Galactic Empire than one would think. But anyway guys, I put everything into a two uh, episode mini-series. Today we're going to be talking about the space and aerial combat, and in our next episode we're going to be talking about the ground assault. So guys, don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button so you don't miss that next video. Let's set up our scenario. It's the year 2017, and an Imperial Survey Corps team has discovered a planet designated as Sol Green. It had a Type 1 breathable atmosphere and one of the most diverse biomes they had ever seen. The planet had deserts, jungles, tundras, grasslands, mountains, tropical islands. It was almost as if someone had taken every planet in the Empire and put them on this planet. Strange. And better yet, preliminary scans have shown that the planet was populated by only humans, no alien scum. It wasn't that the Empire was xenophobic, it was just that aliens made better slaves, especially Wookiees. Speaking of Wookiees, this planet even had their own subspecies that matched Wookiee DNA by 99.8%, which was just fascinating. Over the years, convergent evolution theory had proven itself true over and over again. That or there is some kind of magical omnipotent being who was seeding all the planets in the galaxy with life. After connecting to the planetary information network, the scout survey team found that Sol 3's inhabitants had just exited the atomic age without destroying the entire planet. Which is actually quite admirable. They had reached the information age only a few years ago. The planet lacked a strong central government. Instead, large swaths of land were ruled by regional warlords, and fighting was common, but often resulted in nothing more than heated exchanges on their version of the Hollow Net. There were a few leaders, however, that could make good regional governors for the Empire with the proper training. The survey team decided to land in an area known as being the Cradle of Civilization for Humanity. It was sparsely populated in a perfect place to discreetly conduct some geological surveys. The locals were extremely hospitable and invited them into their homes for the night, a custom that these nomadic people seemed to practice. Their dinner was unfortunately interrupted by what sounded like a primitive slug thrower. Stepping outside, the survey team saw armed individuals rounding up their gracious host and curiously inspecting their ship. These individuals were different in their mannerisms from the people they first encountered, almost subhuman as a matter of fact. They reminded the Imperials of a species known as the Tusken Raiders. Weeks later, the Imperial Survey Team appeared on news outlets around the world in a gruesome execution. Oddly enough, no country stepped forward and claimed ownership over the victims. As a matter of fact, no one even knew where they came from. Some people theorized that this was some kind of sick viral advertising campaign made by the largest media company in the world. After all, the victims were cosplaying as characters in their most successful franchise. The Imperial Survey Team had sent the data package off-world with preliminary survey information on Soul 3. They also managed to send the distress beacon off before their capture. Resources were thin as the Empire was fighting insurgents and terrorists across the galaxy, so only one battle squadron was sent to investigate. This included one Imperial Star Destroyer supported by a dozen light cruisers and three legions of stormtroopers. Upon reaching the system, they intercepted video footage of Tusken Raider-like creatures executing the survey team. Normal protocol would be to exterminate all life forms on the planet, but due to the planet's human population and abundant natural resources, minimal collateral damage was a mission parameter. The Empire would need to carry out a ground invasion in order to occupy this world. The Imperial Squadron deploys an entire Stormtrooper Legion down to the surface. They are escorted by several wings of TIE Fighters. Now let's look at the TIE Fighter. It's a cheaply mass-produced single-seat fighter designed primarily for space combat. In atmosphere, well, let's be honest, it just won't fly well at all. The wings don't actually produce any kind of lift, so all flight really depends on brute engine strength, and they'll be fighting against air resistance and gravity. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't be surprised that if in real life a TIE fighter actually flew in our atmosphere, it would shatter the second it would try to do any maneuvers. But let's say the average TIE fighter could fly, and they also brought along a wing or two of the more aerodynamic TIE striker. How would they do against a United Human Air Force? The TIE Striker has a top speed of around 900 miles per hour. Meanwhile, your average fourth generation jet can fly at around 1400 miles per hour in atmosphere. 
But that's fine because dogfights are usually fought at around Mach 1 or even slower. The TIE Striker's only air-to-air -air weaponry is line-of-sight laser cannons, which could tear through any fighter jet we have on Earth. But most likely, our pilots wouldn't need to engage the TIE Fighters in close-range combat. With the advancement of air-to-air -air missiles, modern-day engagements take place at distances far outside of visual range. And because the TIE Interceptor didn't have any countermeasures or shields, they wouldn't really stand a chance. To illustrate this point, in 1982, during Operation Mole Cricket 19, around 100 fourth generation fighter jets went up against 100 Syrian third generation Soviet jets. The operation had only lasted a day, but by nightfall the Syrian Air Force had lost 90% of their aircraft, along with a considerable amount of their pride. The Israelis only suffered damage to two of their aircraft and lost a few UAVs. It was the most lopsided battle since, I don't know, Anakin killing those younglings in the Jedi Temple? <laughs> Okay, you, you, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't be making fun of innocent children getting slaughtered. I don't know. Anyway, most of the kills came outside of visual range. That's because the main Israeli air-to-air -air missile had a maximum range of 35 nautical miles. And again, this was almost 40 years ago. Even the North Koreans would be able to take down a couple of TIE fighters. So the Imperial Landing Force's air cover and escorts would be utterly destroyed. Larger, shielded troop carriers have a slightly better chance of surviving. In Star Wars, there are two types of shields, ray shields that can stop energy weapons like lasers and blasters, and then there are particle shields which can stop physical objects like slug throwers and missiles. Larger ships like Star Destroyers carried both, but there are examples of Imperial vessels that don't have particle shield coverage, for instance, the Death Star's exhaust vent. While it is possible for heavily shielded transports to take on air-to-air -air missiles and SAM sites, they should probably expect some heavy casualties. Okay, now it's the Empire's turn to cause some destruction. At this point, unless the Imperial Commander is Kendall Ozzel, they would have reassessed the situation. The people of Sol 3 are clearly very militarized, and although they have limited space combat abilities, they completely have control over their own local airspace. The next logical step for them to take would be to destroy our satellite network around the planet. Their very advanced sensors would probably be able to detect all of our stealth satellites and probably even the Nazis on the dark side of the moon. The next step that this commander would take would be to stretch the uh, no collateral damage mission parameter as much as possible. The Star Destroyer fleet along with its supporting light cruisers would strategically take out all major military installations on the planet, starting with major air bases along with anti-air defenses. The commander also has the option of destroying a few cities to send a message to the inhabitants of Sol 3 and test their resolve. Entire cities would be leveled without warning, causing massive civilian casualties. Earth's air forces would suffer heavy losses as well, but because the battle squadron is only made up of a little more than a dozen ships, a percentage of aircraft and personnel were able to scatter or hide in more remote bases and underground bunkers. At this point of the battle, the Earth's leaders would have to consider using nuclear weapons. If the Imperials are in atmosphere while they're bombarding our cities, the nuclear weapons would work as they usually do. But if they're bombarding us from orbit, our nuclear weapons would have significantly lower impact. Without atmosphere, there would be nothing for the blast wave to travel through. So our nuclear warheads would have to penetrate a Star Destroyer's particle shields in order to cause some real damage. So how much damage can a Star Destroyer particle shield take? It has been said in Legends that a proton torpedo has a yield in the 100 plus megaton range. But that actually makes no sense. Let's compare this explosion from a pair of proton torpedoes dropped by a Y-Wing to an atomic bomb test with a yield of only a few kilotons. There is no way that a proton torpedo can generate more energy than an atomic bomb, and definitely not a hydrogen bomb. So if a Star Destroyer can only take a limited amount of hits from a proton torpedo, I think it's completely possible for an ICBM or multiple ICBMs to penetrate a Star Destroyer's shields and destroy it. It would require a coordinated effort and several missiles being fired simultaneously in order to overcome the Star Destroyer's robust point defense system. However, ICBMs like the Russian R-36 can deliver 10 warheads simultaneously, and most ICBM systems have countermeasures and decoy warheads. Nuclear weapons also release electromagnetic pulses and deadly amounts of radiation. So in the end, I do think our planet has the capability of defending itself against a small Galactic Empire task force. But that's only for the first wave. The Empire, of course, has around 25,000 Star Destroyers, which, by the way, outnumbers the entire nuclear stockpile on Earth. Eventually, if they wanted to, the Empire could easily overwhelm our defenses. It wouldn't even be fair. But should we make it difficult enough for them to conquer us and they don't resort to just glassing our planet or blowing it up with the Death Star, 
we do stand a chance. But guys, let's do a poll. I want to see what you guys think. Will we be able to survive in this kind of scenario? Just click on the circle in the top right corner, and I'll let you guys know the results in one of our next episodes. Next time, we'll be taking the fight to the ground. We'll be comparing the ground forces of our planet versus the galactic empires. Guys, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you know when that episode comes out. And as usual, thanks for joining us. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.